according to the schedule, uh, this is the time where I should start. And in fact, it is a fairly tight schedule, so uh, we might just get in right now. So um, I'm going to talk about Threpple, the one-stop ZFS replication solution that I've been developing for uh, yeah, a, year, a year now, basically. I gave a short glimpse at Threpple at EuroBSDCon uh, FreeBSD Dev Summit last autumn, but uh, basically straight as I went home, I started writing my bachelor uh, thesis. So uh, actually not that much has happened since then. However, I see a lot of faces that didn't attend the Dev Summit in Paris. So I guess there will be a lot of interesting stuff to talk about here. So let's get right in. What is the problem that we're trying to solve? CFS replication in its most basic form should be probably familiar to everyone, just a quick refresher what it's about. So um, assume you have uh, like a production uh, database server, for example, pg01.example.com, which is hosting our Postgres database, and this Postgres database keeps its data in the zeroed vardb pg file system. And uh, now we want to replicate the contents of this file system to our backup server to the file system backup slash pg01 slash zeroed slash var db pg. So pretty simple. Uh, what do we need to do? At first, we need uh, snapshot management because ZFS replication only works with snapshot. I guess everyone is kind of familiar with it. So we will need some way to create a snapshot. And then uh, as the next step, need some kind of mechanism to talk to the other side. And in this case, we will start from the backup server and do a pull style backup. And uh, so the backup server will need to talk to the database server, somehow figure out which snapshots do I already have. In this case, we don't have any. And which ones does the other side have? And then follow an incremental uh, replication. And this is basically a diff in a very simple form. So we have, uh, we'll do a ZFS list on the, the backups.example.com server, then talk to the other side, do a ZFS list there, get the result back, build a diff, and uh, yeah, then we know what to replicate. In this case, it will be a full replication of snapshot A to the backup server. So then to do the actual replication, we'll need to coordinate the send and receive commands on each side. And uh, like for the RPC, we will need some kind of transport mechanism for this. So again, talk to, this, talk to the other side, tell it to start a ZFS send, then start the ZFS receive on our side. And yeah, here it is snapshot has been transferred. The last piece that has been missing for me personally is to make this whole thing continuous. Like it is very easy to, to do this manually. You have an SSH session here and an SSH session there. You compare the lists and you yeah, do the replication once. But uh, to do this in the background continuously, it's a whole di different story. And uh, uh, so what I want it to look like is basically to create more snapshots on this side then automatically have it replicate those snapshots here, even more snapshots, replication, then slowly convert the snapshots on the sending side into bookmarks, and uh, with the new snapshot actually take advantage of the bookmarking feature to, uh, uh, yeah, to do the replication, to, the, to do the incremental replication from C to D. What's also missing is that we will want to not only prune on the sending side, but also on the receiving side. So, uh, very often there is some kind of uh, grandfathering scheme in place where you want to fade out snapshots that are becoming older. So we, in the past, like in the distant past, you will have a very uh, low backup resolution. But for the last, say, one day or one hour, you will want a snapshot resolution of 10 minutes. So you can roll back small changes and not lose a huge bunch of data that has been produced in the meantime. So with that, this is only the beginning. There are, the problem space is actually much bigger. So uh, the example I showed was only one file system and regularly you will have more file systems. As we discussed in the previous session, you will probably have many file systems to replicate, one per customer. And all this uh, needs to happen some, somehow. You will have another layer of replication here, coordinate which file systems are on which side uh, and so on. And also for VMs, like if your VMs are backed by Zvolts, then you will have the same issue there. Also, in the yeah, last two years, resumable send and receive has uh, basically become available on all significant platforms, or at least those platforms that are significant to me. So you will, <laughs> so you will 
likely want resumable send and receive. This is particular, in, particularly interesting for laptops. For example, on my laptop, I run ZFS as my root file system, and I basically want to be able to dump this cup of water that is here onto my laptop and at most lose 10 minutes of data, uh, 10 minutes of work. And to have this happen, to allow this to happen, uh, even on flaky connections, having a resumable send and receive would be very nice. And uh, having support for this built in is kind of a requirement for me. But there is not just resumable send and receive, there is also other new CFS features, and we'll come to them later. The whole point of them is that they are not yet available on all platforms. So, for example, compressed send and receive is still very new. I think it's not, maybe it's in FreeBSD head, but it's definitely not in FreeBSD 11.1. Maybe, it, oh, okay, it will be in 11.2. So there are some kind of interoperability issues uh, depending on which, which feature is available on which, on which side. Then there is a thing about uh, trust. Like if you don't fully trust the sender or the receiver to, to uh, yeah, with, with wildcard SSH access to your box, basically, then uh, many tools are yeah, very limited in what you can do about that. So we saw the whole uh, invert the replication flow uh, in the previous talk, but uh, still for me this is really not enough, and uh, I want something better there. From an operational point of view, I was very dissatisfied with uh, with these solutions that just use cron to coordinate and then have some independent cron job on the other side, uh, casually drop in, do some replication, delete some snapshots. This is really uh, not a clean design for me. I want the system that is handling all my data and that is capable of doing a ZFS destroy in the end to log what it is doing and to log uh, not only error conditions but uh, down to the debug level. I, uh, if there is something going wrong or uh, if there is a problem, I really want to be able to, to debug that. And not only debugging but uh, just monitoring, so I want some monitoring endpoints that I can point my monitoring system to and get alerted when things are going bad. And at last, software maintenance. So Again, I do not want to, to bash on ZX for too much because it is a useful tool, but on the other hand, uh, it doesn't even support bookmarks at this point, at least last time I checked. And uh, it is not only, like with these tools, you have a lot of different scripts that were put together to solve a specific use case, but they usually don't get updated. And so for those of you who say, yeah, what are you doing here? I can do all what you say uh, in a shell script. Uh, yes, you can. And ZFS is perfect for this if you do it for your specific use case. The ZFS command line is, I like it very much for, for these, these one-off scripts, but if you want to provide a general purpose solution that fulfills all the, the feature checkboxes that I just presented, uh, I don't think Shell is uh, the right solution to, to this. And prove me wrong, but so far I, I have not seen many other uh, yeah, ZFS tools take advanced use of the newer features. Okay, so. This is basically where ZREPL come, or ZREPL comes in. It is an integrated solution for ZFS replication with a particular focus on ease of use and long-term maintainability of the source code. So uh, what I'm going to do is basically present the main technical differentiators of uh, ZREPL and then give a demo of uh, how a basic deployment of ZREPL would look like. And afterwards, we'll have some Q&A and uh, hopefully some discussion. So the design of the system from a bird's eye perspective, it looks basically like this. You have a ZREPL daemon on each side of the deployment setup, and each side is uh, locally responsible for the snapshot management on that machine. And we'll go into detail what snapshot management means in terms of ZREPL. In addition, ZREPL daemons talk to each other using a well-defined RPC protocol. So we do not have wildcard SSH access or something similar but we actually have a protocol that is also extensible uh, for future use. And uh, now let's take a look at what, what the snapshot management looks like, because this is the first part that you need to take care of. ZREPL has a uh, feature for automatically generating snapshots or creating snapshots in a fixed time interval, and it will not just create the snapshot, but also the bookmark. And uh, the naming scheme for this is pretty straightforward. You will have a user-defined prefix to make it not collide with other automatic uh, snapshot solutions that you might use concurrently. And uh, in addition to the, the prefix, it will append a, a formatted date in UTC. The pruning side is a bit more complicated. 
So for snapshots, we have something called a retention grid, which is, you can think of it like a sieve that is based on time, and I'll give an example uh, in a few seconds. For bookmarks, we just use a fixed drop-off count. Like you will have 100 bookmarks, and the oldest bookmarks get dropped at the end. And how these two things to play together can be best explained by the following example. So, so what you see here, I, will, I hope the, the font size is big enough. Um, we have an excerpt from the zeroable config from, uh, for one specific command uh, job, which is called production one. The snapshot and bookmarks will carry the zeroable underscore prefix, uh, and uh, snapshots will be taken every 15 minutes. Pruning is following the retention grid pruning policy. As you can see, this is configurable, and uh, while this is currently the only supported pruning policy, more pruning policies are to come in the future. But the grid is very flexible, and it works like this. Imagine like on the left side, so where the cursor is right now, this corresponds to this side of this time interval blocks. This is where you are now. This is time.now, the current time. And from then on, we go into the past, and uh, yeah, fragment the past into time intervals that each carry this keep count. And the keep count specifies how many snapshots are allowed in that time interval. And when performing the pruning, Zeripple takes this kind of time slot sieve, so all these time intervals, and uh, sorts the snapshots in where they are sorted by their creation time. And then it ensures that only the specified count of snapshots is actually in that time interval. So it will delete superfluous snapshots in these time intervals, and by having longer and longer intervals with uh, lower keep counts in the more distant past, you basically uh, can implement a grandfathering scheme. If you don't care about that at all, then it's very simple to just specify uh, like uh, a, long, a long time interval and just say keep equals all, and uh, zero people will keep everything. But uh, many people want these grandfathering schemes, and the reason why I implement it like this and not with uh, like prefix uh, suffixes like Zerpel daily, Zerpel weekly, Zerpel monthly is that uh, it plays very nicely together with replication and the bookmarks. So what we see here, the, the bookmarks count, it's very easy. It will keep 100 bookmarks. This means uh, you will have a resolution of 15 minutes for 100 times 50 minutes, this means uh, 1,500 minutes, which is 25 hours, I think. So uh, for 25 hours, your replication is allowed to go down, and you will be guaranteed to keep up again by using the bookmarks. The snapshots on the source side might have already been gone away, but the bookmarks are still there. And this is kind of your administrative responsibility to, to configure this properly, but this is uh, all very well documented, so it shouldn't be that hard to follow. Now that we have created the snapshots, let's look at how a replication looks like. The, we kind of go a bottom-up uh, explanation here. So we start at the bottom with the transport abstraction. Uh, I find it very uh, important to, to keep this modularized. And in Zeripple, the transport, all it needs to do is be a bidirectional authenticated byte stream. And this sounds fancy. It is basically every pipe where you know the other end. and uh, you could also like think of TCP uh, plus TLS. This is also an authenticated byte stream. So um, the whole transport thing is uh, meant to be very pluggable. On top of the transport, we built an RPC protocol uh, that is then used to list remote file systems, list remote snapshots and bookmarks, uh, perform a send or a receive. And uh, this protocol, by having this explicit protocol instead of wildcard SSH access, we can also define per client access control lists or specific mappings. So giving clients a different perspective on what they see on the other side of the replication than what is currently possible by just using SSH. On top of that, again, is then the generic algorithm for diffs and incremental replication. So uh, this algorithm basically sees RPC endpoints at both sides and then uh, will just replicate whatever you tell it to do. So uh, in our case, it will replicate as efficiently as possible with as many supported features as possible. Or if you turn that off, then they will be turned off. Core features of the algorithm are that it supports bookmarks out of the box. That is no special case, no hack on. This is just uh, what we use. And uh, by keeping it generic, we can support both 
pull modes like the one we did in the example before, and push setups, which you would likely use on your laptop, without any code duplication internally. And this, uh, I think, with regards to long-term maintainability is uh, a big plus. Negotiation of, uh, then there is the feature of negotiating advanced DFS send features, uh, which we'll come to in a second, and uh, all the, the critical code in, the generic, uh, in this generic replication algorithm is in fact uh, re re reusable and unit tested. So uh, uh, I hope to, to catch some, some future bugs that occur when we extend the, extend the software then. So about the transport, it's kind of a, a dirty hack that I uh, did and I wanted to, wanted to share with you because actually I like it. So right now I don't really trust myself with putting ZRepple on the internet directly. Uh, if you can avoid that, that's always a good idea. And for the needs that I have, I don't really uh, need that, that degree of performance that, I, that SSH would be a problem. So right now we only have the SSH plus standard in server transport, but again, you only need to provide a bidirectional authenticated byte stream. This is very easy to extend to say TLS or uh, anything else. So what we do is we need to connect this Zrepl daemon to the Zrepl daemon down here. And uh, how we do it is we fork and exec uh, the SSH binary and give it all the arguments it needs to connect to the other side. SSH does all the dirty work for us to uh, prevent us from, the, from this muddy cloud here. And as soon as we are on the other machine, we use uh, the forced command feature of OpenSSH to force the other side to specifically execute this command. It's REPL standard in server and then the authentication ID of this client. And keep in mind that this side here is in control of what is in this file. So uh, this way uh, we have the authentication basically done. All this helper command does is connect to the actual Zrepl daemon and then forward the standard in and standard out of this process using control message to the Zrepl daemon. And this is kind of a neat feature if you have played around with it, you can send file descriptors over Unix sockets. So uh, you essentially avoid all the, the copying that would be required otherwise. So the only copies that we have in this, is, in this schema is from the Zrepl daemon to SSH. Then SSH will of course do the copying back into the kernel, then over the internet, back to this SSH daemon, then goes back to user space, but due to the file descriptor passing, we pass it directly to the Zrepl daemon. So this is at least somewhat efficient, and I like the dirty hack with the, with the control messages, and I kind of wanted to share that. So, so much for that. It's more complicated than it sounds, I think. We built the RPC protocol on top. The current version of the RPC protocol has some shortcomings that prohibit the implementation of the push feature, which is why I present the, the new version of the protocol here. I have it working on my laptop, but it's not uh, pushed yet. So. Again, it's built on top of this, this simple transport mechanism, and uh, I didn't use anything like gRPC or Captain Proto or something uh, due to performance reasons that I encountered while playing with those. So it's homegrown, very simple, uh, it's request response based, and each request can basically ship a bag of bytes that you know the size of. This is called the structured part, and then you can ship a stream where you, as the sender, do not know the size <coughs> before the stream has actually finished streaming. And this is what we need for pushing a ZFS send stream over the wire or receiving a ZFS uh, send stream over the wire. And then we just address the other side. So if you want uh, to list file system on the other side, you, you would set the endpoint uh, attribute to this, to this RPC endpoint. Then the other side would serialize the, this response in the structured part. If you actually need to respond with a with a ZFS send stream, then uh, you could use the streaming feature for it. So this is kind of uh, this part. I hope I didn't make too many beginner mistakes in designing this protocol, because uh, this is typically, a, it is a beginner's mistake to, to do some things here that you would otherwise not want to do. Anyways, with this protocol on top, we can build some neat features around that. So for example, access control lists, access control lists for the puller. You can define on the side that is being pulled, so imagine the PG01 server here, can define which file systems are actually allowed to be accessed and visible to the other side. So you can say, I want the other side to see everything in 0 bar db and below it. This is what this angle bracket represents, 
like a tree that spans up. And uh, you can also see zero user home, but you cannot z see what uh, zero user home Joe has in his home directory. And this is because Joe is paranoid and doesn't want his, uh, doesn't want his home directory to be replicated somewhere. As an example to demonstrate the, the flexibility that you get, I have also uh, included the zero slash CDN feature here. So everything under zero slash CDN is also accessible to the other side. On the pulling side, so uh, yeah, the side that is the backup server in our example, we then have a mapping that specifies where things, so file systems from the other side should go. In this case, we will use this wildcard here to uh, default every, everything to map under storage backups P1. So in the end, uh, for example, 0 var db will be under storage backups P1, 0 var db. But if you need some special treatment, for example, for the CDN, which should, map, should be mapped somewhere differently, so it can be, uh, yeah, uh, so it is in the, the web server's home directory or whatever, then you can, can also specify this here. And this is uh, a little bit more flexible than what you can get with uh, ZFS send R, and it's kind of a, a no brainer feature that you need to implement. Yes? Yes, so I'm aware of ZFS allow. The problem is that we don't really want, yeah, so, so we want the, the, the replication user on the other side to not even have an SSH account on the, on the other side. This would help in some privilege separation scenarios, which we'll come back to in the, in the like, wrap up of the talk. But uh, yeah, we don't use the ZFS allow flag and we also don't use any ZFS properties for reasons of implementation simplicity at this point. Okay, there's another aspect of this. So beyond the flexibility, again, sender and receiver do not need to fully trust each other. Actually, I was uh, pointed at some very important aspects uh, of the ZFS receive behavior in various discussions at this conference. So right now, you do not want to like have any random remote, <coughs> remote site uh, push data to the receiving site. This is not as well documented as I would have hoped it to be, and I hope to, to send a to pull request quite soon, because this is uh, something that need, people need to be aware of. But in theory, on the protocol level, the sites do not need to trust each other. New ZFS features. This is uh, probably the, the most interesting aspects of a new solution here. So. Uh, of course, resumable send and receive is kind of kind of everywhere right now, so I would like to use it. But there's also compressed send and receive and deduplicated send and receive. If you have deduplication enabled, this is probably interesting for you. Uh, and then large blocks and write embedded. I don't have a personal use case for that, but they exist, and uh, why not also support them? So the way they are supported in the protocol is very generic. Because they require support on both sending and receiving side, uh, we have some kind of negotiation mechanism. It works similar to what you have in HTTP. So you will send the, 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 the client that requests the ZFS send stream will put up something equivalent to an accept header. And this header will contain all the, all the supported features on the receiving side. And then the, uh, yeah, the other side can, can look, OK, I have these, this set of intersecting features and then generate a stream that is compatible between the two sites. And this all sounds very trivial, but you should acknowledge that this is only possible because we do the extra mile of actually implementing a proper protocol in between. So uh, this is not just wildcard SSH access here. The operational point of view, very important to me. Uh, Zerpl has extensive logging throughout its entire code base, and it is highly structured. So you can enable logging at the debug level. You can, you can configure it to go to multiple destinations, for example, to a standard out. You can configure it to go to a syslog or even a remote TCP socket with, with TLS or without TLS. doesn't matter. So um, kind of uh, the ground there is pretty much covered. You can specify the log format. You can say, I want something re human readable for the human operator. But if you want to process uh, the log data with some kind of uh, log stash or something, you can uh, also send JSON or log FMT if you want. For those who want to just SSH into the machine and look what it is doing, there is also a Zrapple control status command, which basically gives you an overview of the different jobs that are configured in the configuration file. 
and what they are doing right now. And uh, this is split out by the different activities that a job encompasses. So you have one activity which takes care of the snapshotting and the pruning, and another activity that takes care of the, the actual uh, connection, like either connecting to some site, so this would be the client part, or being the server part. And you can, can look at that. There is also the, uh, the option to export a Prometheus, mount, uh, Pro Prometheus endpoint. Uh, for those of you who use Prometheus, there is also uh, support for exporting SysCTL. It's coming in, I think it's 12, so this will not be backported. But in FreeBSD 12, we will have the ability to automatically export all SysCTLs. And uh, yeah, for those of you who, who are familiar with it, uh, Shrapple integrates very nicely. There's also for debugging performance problems, as, as I said, Zrepl is still in a very early stage. Uh, you can run the Zrepl control pprof command to, uh, to enable uh, trace points that you can then use uh, with debug tooling to get information on where time is spent executing the code or uh, look at heap profiling and all this. This kind of alludes, the, in particular, the pprof alludes to the next site. Uh, Zrepl is not implemented in Shell, but in Go. And uh, as I said, we have unit tests for the most critical code paths. And on my laptop, there are still some that are not that reusable, but at least cover a lot of more code. Uh, Go is very portable. As you can see in the lower right, this is all I need to do to compile Zrepl for all supported platforms. So uh, four lines, and, and you're good to go there and uh, the binaries are freestanding. So uh, again, no dependencies on anything else. Uh, this is all statically linked. Uh, the performance is uh, not so much of a concern to us because most of the time is spent in ZFS send and getting the data actually out of the wire. But uh, for the parts that are interactive, uh, Go performance is certainly nice. And the type safety helps with long-term maintainability. So does the, the quite good tooling around it. On top of that, Zrepl is extensively documented. I spent a lot of time writing the documentation. The entire configuration format is documented in quite high detail resolution, you could say. There is also a tutorial that should get you started pretty soon and which I will also use for the, for the upcoming demo. So uh, if you have any like, uh, questions or uh, yeah, don't understand something in the contract file, there's a good chance this is documented. And if not, please, report it or actually improve the documentation. It's not that hard, it's swings. So with that, uh, we'll come to the tutorial. As I said, this is adapted from, from what you have in the, on the actual Zerpel website. So I'll leave the presentation here. I wonder if it will stay at the right slide. Okay, so the idea is to, to follow this tutorial and now let me go back again. One more slide. This is the scenario. So we have the production server, which contains some file systems that we want to replicate, and also contains this, this paranoid user that doesn't want to be replicated. And uh, on the receiving side, that will do the actual pull job. Uh, yeah, we have some, some uh, file system reserved, and everything will go below that. In Zrepl terminology, this will be a source job on the production server. So we define a source job on this side. And on the pull, uh, so on the backup server, we will define a pull job. And this is kind of the, the schema. A pull job always pulls from a source job. So switching to the to tutorial again. This is kind of what I said right now. So the analysis part is also not that interesting. Zrepl is already installed on the machine. So we have this installed from ports. By the way, it's already in ports. Thanks to Ben Woods for that. And uh, uh, sorry, I forgot the name of the initial porter, but Ben Woods is the maintainer for now. So we'll define this pull job on the backup server. And uh, for simplicity, I will simply copy and paste and then adjust the configuration. So we start a Tmux session here. Is it uh, large enough, the font? I hope so. So and I, let's go through the individual lines. So we'll name this job somehow like pull prod one. And this is a job that is of type pull job. And again, you can read on the job types in the documentation. We will connect. So we specify where we want to connect. So in this case, 
the IP address of the other side. This will be this IP address. Just paste it here. Port can stay the same, and then we will adjust this path to be actually sensible to the FreeBSD file system hierarchy. So we have this identify, which is the SSH key that we will use to authenticate to the other side's SSH server. We still need to generate that. So let's split the screen and let's generate an, well, which one is the nice short one? ED25519, right? And we'll call this identity, no passphrase, and now we have the identity and the public key here. So this is all written down in the tutorial too, but uh, I think for, uh, oh, we still have enough time. Okay, so we can actually look what, what the tutorial says here. So I created the key, and uh, now it tells us to use this key once to get the uh, the fingerprint of the remote host public keys into our known host file. So we'll do that. Yep, of course. Okay, and now it's prompting us with the password, which is fine because we still need to put in the public key on the other side. But the important part is that we now have the, the, the fingerprint of the public key in the host file. So let's go through the remainder of the configuration file again. So up in the upper right. So we are done with the connect section and now go to the interval section. We'll adjust that to actually make uh, pulls every four seconds because uh, to move fast here. And then we'll uh, look at our File systems, file systems that we have here, and we'll put it under just, what did we want? Somewhere here. So the mapping will be everything from the left side goes to storage backups prod one and the things below it. The replication policy can be left as is, and we'll abbreviate the snapshot prefix a bit and send it to a Zirpl underscore. And the pruning policy is, uh, could also be adjusted. So this is the backup side. We have a lot of storage there, so we we'll probably keep around like the first 60 seconds of all snapshots that come in, and then have one minute intervals. So maybe, yeah, let's 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 have six one minute intervals, and afterwards just just drop everything that we have. Like again, this is a test deployment, but uh, we want to see some action here and not wait for one hour until the next snapshot is taken, right? Okay, so this should be done on the, the backup side, so now we can configure the, the production side. It's basically a very symmetric thing, so I will copy the sample configuration here, spawn a Tmux session, I wonder why it works on the right machine and the left machine. Okay, so we have the configuration here. Leave the name as is. It is a source drop, and uh, we'll define that uh, we we'll want to listen as type standard in server. This is the crazy transport hack that I presented before. The client identity will be simply backups, and you'll notice in a second we specify this on the command line. So looking at the file systems that we have on this machine, we have user home, Alice, Bob, Paranoid, VRDB. Okay, looks fine. And we'll just keep this configuration here. The prefix will be Zrepl underscore, and the snapshotting interval will be every 10 seconds. And we will keep snapshots for 60 seconds before pruning them right away. And we will keep 100 bookmarks because they are cheap. And again, from the calculation, this allows us 10 seconds times 100 bookmarks downtime before it could happen that like we don't even have a bookmark on the other side that is also on the on the backup side. So what needs to be done is 
modifying the authorized keys file to actually contain the public key that we use to authenticate from the other side. So we will just copy and paste it in this case and then insert the false command Uh, like this, and you can also restrict it, so that's actually useful. And notice that this backups section right here corresponds to the client identity that we specified in the config file. Okay, so now let's see how this works out. I will start a GNU watch command to list all snapshots and bookmarks that oops, that are created on this side. So right now there are no snapshots created yet. But if I start the daemon, and I will keep it in the foreground, so wait a second, the snapshots start being created. So you can see here, we have the snapshot, we have the bookmark, and this is the basically the automatic snapshot management. And this is all we need to do, and the pruning will happen as we exceed the 60 minute mark, uh, 60 second mark. So now let's have some actual replication. So I will set up the GNU watch command again on this side. And just for fun, because the file systems, you know, are still not created, let's also watch. the file systems that are present on the backup server. So start the Zrempel daemon, and we should see the bookmarks flow in. So, and this is basically all you need to do, and this will run happily on its own for uh, basically until you kill it. You can also use this Zrempel control status feature, so I opened, I opened, I opened a new Tmux window and you can see, well, currently the main process is idling, but in, at the second time I issued the command, it was not idling. And it prints you the amount of data that was transferred uh, since the last time it left the idle state. So this is useful for a quick glimpse. Like, because the replication time is so short in this example, we do not actually see the neat features that we have at this point here, because what this allows us, uh, what will be printed here if the replication takes like 15 minutes, is a semantic stack trace. So it will tell you, I am currently pulling file systems, and I am currently pulling this file systems, and I'm currently doing that. So it is more transparent to an administrator what the software is actually doing compared to other tools that at best print something like uh, CFS send failed to the command line. You can also increase the verbosity. So how this is actually implemented is the Zrapple daemon buffers a few of the log output lines. And you can actually see that with level info. And well, this is actually not very helpful if you do not have any problems. But if you are diagnosing a specific problem, like you can see very precisely, OK, we were at this point in the code, and we are doing this kind of replication from the source to the target and you can easily follow what the daemon is doing. Okay, I think that's what I wanted to show in the demo. Let's get back to the presentation. So what is on the roadmap for Zrepl? You saw the construction site signs during the talk. Uh, this is work that is kind of almost done, and much of it is depending on the finishing of the RPC protocol re-implementation. So I hope to commit this in the next several weeks, and afterwards, push support and ZFS feature negotiation should be in fairly soon. What is kind of an unsolved problem right now is ZFS feature discovery. So I do not have the code yet to actually determine which features are supported on each site, because there is no, no way this is currently available in ZFS, and this will likely be a project that I will be working on in ZFS myself. So as long as this is not in the official ZFS binary, it will likely be that administrators will have to configure that in the configuration file. 
Uh, property sync is another aspect that I do not have a personal use case of because I do not like storing data in the ZFS properties, but I think a lot of people do like. Alan is giving me some signs that I, okay. Uh, anyways, okay, so uh, yeah, uh, property sync will, will need some, some solution here. The, the problem is that uh, the properties are not part of the snapshot and I still need uh, I think it would be neat to have some, some way to actually store different versions, so storing the development of the snapshots over, uh, of the attributes over time. And uh, yeah, whether we should use some, some kind of version control system and leave that as a hook to the user, or uh, maybe do some, some other crazy things with uh, directory naming scheme or something. Uh, this is totally feasible, but yeah, I need some kind of motivation to do that. A far greater motivation to me is laptop mode. Like um, on servers, it is no problem to just have this all be done periodically and also have the replication happen periodically. But on my laptop, I kind of don't want to have it eat up my five gigabytes of mobile data when I'm on the train. So uh, I want to explicitly trigger the replication part, but I still want the, the snapshot taking and snapshot management part to happen, uh, happen automatically in the background. And also, like you can get pretty crazy, like some some nice taskbar widgets or something, on your desktop that that make your life easier there. But that is really uh, far beyond what what I'm planning to do right now. Documenting unprivileged deployment of Circle is uh, something that I want to do. Like I'm running it halfway unprivileged. Like I, I put the the pulling site in a jail, and there's there way isolated the effect that the Circle daemon can have on the host. And uh, there are still some, some ZFS features missing for that. But uh, yeah, at least documenting what I do would probably be a good idea. And lastly, the ad hoc command. So right now there's only the Zerpel daemon because this is my primary use case. But the code is written such that you could easily reuse the, reuse the, reuse the replication logic from a command line tool. So basically having a replacement for ZX for in place at some time uh, that does the same thing. So basically rsync for ZFS. Open ZFS wish list, I think, like I don't know how much time I've left, uh, but I think I talked about a lot of the individual aspects during the various uh, ZFS sessions here. So I would probably like to skip that and go straight to questions. So yeah, thank you for attending the talk. Please try it and give feedback. If you are into Go programming or just want to write good documentation, it is all in the github.com slash zeppel slash zeppel repository. And if you want to reach out, there are my contact details. Thank you. Yes. So the question was what happens when, when you run, like when your replication is down for longer than the amount of bookmarks that they have. So the product of keep bookmarks and interval. So yes, this is kind of the, the failure mode right now. If, you, if your replication is down for longer than this interval, then it is possible that the sites run out of sync. Like uh, you will likely use the bookmark so you won't be able to perform incremental replication from the bookmark and the current snapshot. And if the snapshot is still around by luck, because your grid is longer than your bookmark keeping time, then you might still be able to use that snapshot. But the way the retention grid is implemented, it is not that predictable which snapshots get deleted. Like you get the guarantee that things are fading out over time, but which one specifically depends on like microsecond shifts if you have, if you have bad alignment of snapshot intervals. Like if the snapshot interval is or if the, if the length of an interval is the multiple of the snapshot interval, it could happen that there are some, some bad alignment issues there. And I kind of, uh, I ignored that. <laughs> like I, I'm aware of the problem that this might pose, but uh, in practice, you should keep the key bookmarks interval way longer than your possible retention period.
so the so for the stream, uh, the proposal is to basically only prune when the replication has finished happening. Yes, I thought about that, and in theory, like the, the way the code is structured right now, uh, I kind of didn't account for that. It would be fairly easy to reorganize it. So yeah, then you of course couple the both sides, and this has the downside that if the replication is down for long, and you have high data turnover on the one side that this site could actually fill up. But this is something that you could cover with monitoring. Uh, the, the production site. So imagine you have two gigabytes of writes per hour, and you take a snapshot every 15 minutes, then you will, and you don't delete them because the replication is down. OK, so the proposal was to only keep the bookmarks around until the replication has been done. So yes, this should be totally feasible. I ran to, I, during development, like. Uh, I ran into some interesting performance problems. So I thought bookmarks were really cheap, and they are. They, they don't take any space. But keeping, so my problem was I had, I had 15,000 15, bookmarks per file system because I was taking them at a very high rate and not deleting them. And at some point, I'm still not sure where, and I need to send you the, the reproducer for this. There is some kind of knee in the curve where suddenly the ZFS this time takes way longer than, than you would expect. That's right, because you only move it like, like a cursor. Yes, that's right. OK. Yeah, I take Yeah, that. So the proposal is. The proposal is to convert the, uh, the snapshots to a bookmark right before you actually would destroy the snapshot. Uh, yes, it should be totally feasible. Like it's a different mode of operation. And the thing is, the code is very generic. The problem is to wrap it all up into something that is usable. And writing configuration and configuration parsing and writing useful error messages it's kind of a real pain. Like probably half of the entire code base is dedicated to writing proper log messages and proper error messages in the parser, and I'm still not happy with it. And yeah, so I kind of uh, looked on onto my specific use case. But yeah, you're right. It should be supported. Yeah. Yes. OK, so there is the proposal of basically having pre and post hooks before and after taking a snapshot. So this could be used for like locking the database or making sure the database has, has a consistent state on disk, then taking the snapshot. And again, yeah, this is only a, I have thought about this feature. I think there is, an, there is an issue for it. I have not implemented it yet. But yeah, I realize this would be fair. I guess with MySQL, this would be very useful because I think so as far as I know, you can just snapshot Postgres, but MySQL not so much. But anyways, I could be wrong on that. So yeah, I hope it would be clearly useful. OK. Any more questions? Yes? So the question is whether we send snapshots that are not zeroable snapshots. So internally, this snapshot prefix is both used for as, uh, as the, the thing to determine the name of the snapshot, but it also is also used as a prefix filter. So the view that is presented to the other side only shows the zeroable snapshots. So the question is whether we delete file systems on the target that are not no longer available on the source. The answer is, answer is no. Like right now, we leave it dangling there. And the, currently, the RPC protocol has no no endpoints to actually destroy file systems. So uh, this could be added. Like again, 
personally, my use case is is very limited. Like I back up the server, and also this is probably the more interesting aspect. Restore would currently still be a manual process. Like you could set up REPL to like uh, do a reverse replication, but this would require you to edit config files just for the re uh, just for the, the reverse uh, situation. So yes, this is the work that needs to be done. And my plan is to have the replication functionality in, uh, functionality in, in the rtalk command, and that it could use the same replication logic, but uh, would only be run on occasion. Yeah, so again, uh, the, what is missing is like a more unique identifier of a file system. So right now, yes, you can get the UUID of the file system. You can also get UUIDs of snapshots. Actually, this is probably also interesting. I use the createtxg to, so I use a bunch of features that are I think I pushed uh, an improvement to the CSS on Linux main page to to document that there is the createtxg attribute, that there is the GUID attribute, and I guess these should be upstream, but I think you need to take care of that. I should ta take care of that myself. So I use those internally. I check that they are available on all on all deployed versions of CFS. So I actually don't rely on the, the formatted date and the snapshot names to make an order of the snapshot and all this. Like it's, a few little details uh, that I do, but so essentially for a file system to have proper rename tracking, we would need to have some, some GUID that is unique among different deployments of that file, systems on, file system on other pools. Like when you do a ZFS send right now and you create the file system on the other side, it doesn't have the same GUID. And I kind of need exactly that, a unique identifier for the file system. And this, this is not something that uh, ZFS needs to provide but this would need to be provided by, by Zeripple. So uh, maybe as a quick poll, who would try Zeripple in the room? Okay, this is a success to me, I guess. If so, <laughs> please, 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 please report feedback. Like I'm currently at the state where it works for me and kind of developing in the dark, like not knowing what users actually want is kind of senseless. <coughs> So unless there is feedback, I will only implement the stuff that I need, and I would never have thought about like uh, having the having the bookmarks only be deleted after replication, and so on. Okay, then thank you again. Again, if you want to reach out, email and Twitter details somewhere around here. Thank you. <laughs>